SantaCruzSentinel.com. Hello, and welcome to The Reporter's Notebook, presented by the Santa Cruz Sentinel. I am your host, Anthony L. Solis, and uh, normally we go through a um, behind-the-scenes, you know, uh, of the Sentinel here, uh, one particular topic, but today we're going to go through everything behind the scenes, uh, so to speak. Uh, people have kind of wondered over the years how a story goes from idea to your doorstep. And so joining me today is uh, Managing Editor Kara Myberg guzman Thanks for having me. Yes. And so we're going to talk about, yeah, Idea to Doorstep was kind of something we talked about last week. And you actually had an interview with Bruce Bratton. He interviewed you on his radio show. And right. I listened to it and I, he asked you a lot of questions that a lot of people have asked me over the years. And I thought, what a great idea, actually, for a podcast. We're the ones who know how things are done. Let's demystify it. Let's, you know, let's put it out there. So... From the beginning, from the start, where does a story idea come from? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So reporters have these beats that they're, you know, steeped in, they study in. A a beat is a? Oh, a beat is a subject of study. Like um, examples are homelessness and water issues, crime. Uh, So uh, a lot of the ideas just you know, come from the reporters themselves. They've been following this topic for, you know, months or years and it just, they know it. They know something is coming up, maybe a decision from the city council or, um, in in some, in the case of Michael Todd, who covers crime, you know, he just has to react to crime that happens. Right. So that's where his ideas come from. Or, you know, sometimes he has enterprise stories, uh, that take a deeper look than just reacting to you know right. what, what's coming right. over the police scanner. But yeah, a lot of the stories are generated by the reporters. Um, maybe a quarter of the time I'll have something come off my desk and I'll assign it out to a reporter. Um, but most of the time they're the ones we call it pitching, uh, <laughs> yes. you pitch the story, uh, you know, hope ta- that it gets caught. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, uh, calling me in the morning like hey look I've got this idea for the story what do you think and then we'll sort of talk it over and refine it and then uh, then they're off uh, <laughs> doing the reporting calling people interviewing people um, you know attending the event um, or uh, you know finding out the facts and then you know uh, our deadline for reporters is 4 p.m. every day. So they're. Then, that's the deadline for them to be finished to give it to you. Correct. correct? Okay. Yeah. Uh, for them to have the first draft of their story. So they'll, you know, usually finish their reporting by two or so and then write the story and uh, send it off to the editors and uh, it'll get it's, read. It's the first, first draft of history. <laughs> right the rough draft of history and exactly. then uh i'll give it a read then assistant city editor don fakui will give it a read and we'll don and i will talk about uh you know what we think and give directions to the reporter who will rewrite you know rewrite the story with edits you're, you're giving notes you usually uh we have something in our in our um it's a Adobe in copy is what we're using currently. Uh, we can write notes text. So it's writing in, in the story that nobody else can see. So when we post it online or when we put it on the page, nobody else gets to see that other than, you know, the people who work here and so right. you're asking questions or you're even saying something like, um, uh, CQ, which now that I'm just saying that I have no idea where CQ comes from. I used to know, I can't remember now, but we'll put CQ if a name has an odd spelling and that's the reporter letting the editor know that this is correct. I checked it. I know it's a weird name with Matthew with two E's and five T's or whatever, but it's correct. So, and then, so you've got the story now after 4 PM, you've given them notes. They, they make their changes, any changes or extra calls they need to. And then it comes back to you. Is there a deadline for that? Uh, no, not really. Um, but I mean, our our drop 
deadline is to get it to the next stage by 930. So between 630 and 930, we're, you know, uh, editing, you know, finishing right. you, up. You try to stagger them a little bit. too, yeah. So it doesn't matter if you don't want them all to come in at 630 because you're not going to get to them all. Um, but if you stagger them out a little bit, you know, the last ones come at nine uh, thirty ish, we'll say something right. to that effect. Oh, I forgot uh, backing up a step. We have something called the budget. Oh, the budget. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is the plan of the stories for the day. So usually by 2 p.m. or so, we'll know, you know, what what stories are coming in for the day and we'll plan them out and. Don, Fakui and I will talk about what we think is goes on A1, uh, which is our front page. Like, what's the top yeah. news of the Se- day? Section A, page one. We call it A1. There's A2, B1, B2, that kind of so on and so forth. Right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we have our front page that normally has, you know, a mix of local and national stories, depending on the day. And uh, A2 has, you know all local stories and we just sort of, uh, decide, uh, which takes priority. Um, and then, so, uh, at the end of the night, as we're sending, as we're finishing our edits, uh, they get sent to our design center, our design center being up in Chico. And, um, a couple weeks ago, listeners to the podcast will have uh, heard me talk to Christine Rushton, who technically works in the design center but not on the paper design she's the social media director and but she's working up there with these people who um put together our paper they put together i think what is 16 right papers 16 different papers across norcal and so once they get it how do they know where to put uh the story based on the budget you said you laid out the page but how do they know where on the page it goes oh good question so on this budget which has the list of the stories that we want for our front page and our second page and etc we'll put placement so we'll say okay this story is what we call a centerpiece it's the um you know the center of the page and you know has a photo that goes along with it or this story is stripped which means uh you know it's goes Stripped across the across the top of the page. Right. Um, yeah, maybe you can speak more about what actually happens in the design center <laughs> since you have decades of experience. Yeah, I can speak uh, to what happens on the page. I, I was a designer here for, um, I mean, that was my job here for 15-ish, you know, maybe more years. Um what is going to happen there is a little bit different than what happened here. They uh, work a lot more with templates a lot more. So you might notice that the page looks basically the same every day. I mean, there are some variances and of course the photos and things are different, but, um, and the headlines being different, but you kind of know that you've either got a strip, as you said, across the top, or you have, Uh, a story on the right-hand side that's got the biggest headline. We call that the lead. Anything with the biggest headline, the big, bold uh, headline, we, uh, I can't say an expletive, but, you know, (laughs) oh, crap, the (laughs) the oh, crapper headline. Um, That's that big, bold headline. And it usually means, like, that's the biggest news of the day that we want you to know. So I would uh, take the budget and uh, look at the stories, and I'd put my basic template on the page And then when the stories come in, I would drag them in. Um, When I was designing here, I was able to look at early drafts of the stories and I could kind of start to write a headline or work on a headline. We, you know, we try to get headlines that are clear and concise, but also fit in the space that is allotted. And we want, you know, them to be a certain size, follow certain rules, like bigger headlines at the top of the page, smaller headlines at the bottom. Uh, and Chico still does that as well, but they are working on, you know, maybe each person, maybe three other newspapers. So they're not going to look at it ahead of time. That means there's more responsibility on us here to write a headline that hopefully fits uh, or comes close to fitting uh, so that they know what they're working with a little bit more. So when they'll put the story on the page uh, and then they will do what's called jumping the story. And everybody who reads the front page of the front page story sees that it jumps to a different page because we're not going to fit it all on one page. Uh, they've got to jump it. They've got to square things off, make it fit. Um, squaring off might mean deleting a paragraph or it could mean 
stretching out the words a little bit, that space between the words or the letters so that it you, you cheat a, a line or two one way or the other, just so that everything squares off and looks nice and neat down at the bottom. And uh, then when you're done with the page, you will print it out and you will send it to what is called the slot position. Uh, the person who slots the page is sort of the overall proofreader. They're the final person who's going to look at the page. And usually one slot will look at the entire paper. And in Chico's case, uh, it's one slot looks at all of the pages. Uh, I think they all come through them. They're not all coming in at the same time, but they all do go, go through that one person. And the slot actually... The name for the name slot. Newspapers have all these great, great names. Like I mentioned CQ earlier, which I can't remember what that stands for. But uh, all these terms that are, uh, they don't mean anything necessarily anymore, but they stick. So slot comes from, in the days even before I started working at newspapers, the desks that the copy desk would sit on were U-shaped. Everyone sat next to each other, and a story would start at one end and go all the way around to the U. And then when you got back up to the slot, it was done. That's where slot, you're, you're the slot. There's also uh, a rim, the person who's doing the rim, which is kind of, they can float from wherever they need. Um, they can fill in. And we used to even be able to staff, you're doing rim today, which means if somebody falls behind, you pick up the slack, you fill in the gaps. Um, so once the slot gets it and they look over the page, make sure there's no... Hopefully no major misspellings or curse words and headlines, things like that. Um, They print it. Uh, And by printing it is sending it electronically to uh, a place. Where is our press right now, to be honest? In San Jose. Is it San Jose? Okay. Um, Yeah, they send it electronically from Chico to San Jose. Uh, It comes out at a printing facility there as a negative. And then it gets put on the press the whole paper gets printed out, and then uh, about what time? We, we just found out what time everything finishes up here. Um, so, yeah, from the press, it the papers get loaded in this big 18-wheeler semi-truck. If any of you are driving over 17 at 1 in the morning, you might have seen it. Um, it comes down, uh, arrives at our Sentinel building here on Ensignal Street um, around 2 a.m., and then our delivery crews take them. They lay them out on these big, wide tables, um, assemble the papers, you know, put the inserts in. By, wrap okay, them so up. by inserts and assemble, we're talking what the the weekly, uh, you know, like the TV guides and some of the advertising coupons, coupons yeah. things like that. Yeah, and that, that's not printed there. It's already printed ahead of time. So your mail carrier actually has to put all of those things in and then wrap up the paper. <laughs> Right, and then on rainy days, bag them. Bag them, <laughs> yep, hopefully, <laughs> if, if they like you. <laughs> um, and they're out the door uh, by 3 in the morning, and they start their routes. Um, usually routes can take about, I think, around three hours. Uh, this part of the equation I'm a little fuzzy on. Yeah, it's it's an outsourced company, to be honest. Um, they, they do it out of here, but we uh, don't actually have any control over the, the delivery people, which we hear an awful lot about if somebody misses, you know, doesn't have their paper. We get the calls at the customer service center, but you know, we don't know who the delivery people are. It's just a company that we've contracted. Right. Um, although our circulation director does have yeah, a hand in Marty, it. Yeah, she's Marty. Marty Browning actually has knows knows all. Yeah, <laughs> she knows everything. So yeah, that's how. I mean, and and then it shows up on your doorstep. And uh, you know, we may have glossed over a couple of things here and there. Um, but uh, for example, photog- photos. Um, Shmuel Thaler, Dan Coro will be out taking what we call wild art. Or standalones. There's there are a photo that has no particular um, story associated with it. It's just a nice piece of art. Um, Shmuel is exceptionally good mm-hmm. at them, uh, and those come those come in handy when maybe a story falls through. Um, or sometimes we'll have a story that's really important um, that should go on the front page, but doesn't necessarily have any art. Uh, you know, that doesn't have any. F- photo opportunities attached to it. 
um, like, uh, I don't know, a story about a report that was just released by a subcommittee of city council, <laughs> you know, uh, that w- wouldn't have a good photo to go along with it. It should go on, uh, you know, our front page. And that's when we put sort of a uh, photo in there. Right, to the hold standalone the, photo. Yeah. Yeah. To hold the page. Yeah. We call it holding the page yeah. when it's not attached to a story, but it's a good enough it, piece of art to take the front page. It's so good. It stands alone. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, that's really how things are done now. Uh, there's also, you know, it's kind of the same with uh, the feature pages that I do, um, the same sort of process, I, but I'm dealing mostly with freelancers and I have you know more than a day. I've you know got more, usually a full week between sections. So it's stretched out a little bit, but it's the same basic process. Um, and even with the opinion page that I do, um, you know, where I'm collecting the letters to the editor, we're going over columns and editorial cartoons. Um, but I'm still going and I'm, I'm pulling all these things, kind of putting them together and then sending them off to Chico, uh, as well. So it's the same basic process for all of those. And same thing with sports. Same with sports. Yeah. Except- those sports works, all their stuff happens at night. So all their reporting has to be done very quickly if they have to go cover a game, uh, you know, and their deadline. So their deadline's a little bit later. They get uh, up till about ten o'clock ish, somewhere in there. Um, but if they're covering a football game and the football game ends at ten, uh, you know, poor Jim Seamus has to write a story in about ten minutes and get it in the system and attach the photos to it. Uh, and by attaching the photos, it's really just a drag and drop process. So we go find the photo, we drag it onto the story. They're attached. Um, and then send it to uh, Julie Jag, who will edit the story as fast as humanly possible. <laughs> it's high adre- adrenaline. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, everything happens and comes in all at once at the very end of the night. And uh, it's it's rough. Sports. Uh, I, I, I started here in sports as the sports designer, so I had to design all the pages. And I can tell you... Um, I, I have no qualms about saying this. The working in the sports department is the toughest job at the paper. For sure. Maybe second only to customer service. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Cannon's got a pretty tough job when people miss their paper. But working in the sports department day in, day out, that's it's rough. And uh, you know, I, I I do feel for them and I kinda know I know firsthand my wife is the sports editor, so I'm you know, full disclosure there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I hear about the problems and, and stuff that go on, but but having worked there too, it's it's really really rough to work that fast, and tr- still try to get everything as correct as they do. Switching gears a little bit, we were talking before we went on air about how things were um, back in the day when we <laughs> back in had the a, days, yes. <laughs> when we had a press at the Sentinel. Can you yeah. speak a little about that? Yeah, I mean we we had a lot more staff back then. Um, there's, there's no secret there. <laughs> and uh, when we were downtown and had our own press and uh, had that big building that's now uh, occupied by Cruzio, uh, the process was the same, uh, really, but we were all kind of confined into one space. Um, you might have somebody... Most, my job most of the time was to... Uh, after I got out of sports, I was... Uh, the A1 designer. That was pretty much my job. Um, and for many years, I also did the features section. And when I when I was doing the feature section, most days I was doing the Sunday A1 uh, page. So I couldn't get out of I couldn't get out of working on the weekend. You know, we I'd have to work on Saturday night to do Sunday. Um, and so the process was basically the same. I would uh, uh, I would be the copy editor as well as the designer. So when a story was ready. And I would see it kind of pop up in what we called a, a basket on the computer, but basically a glorified folder. A story would show up in there and I'd know, OK, it's it's ready for me. I would open it up. I would read it. I would do what's called a line edit. Um, the content editing was always done by the uh, the editor. So like you and Don Fukui, you're, you're asking those questions, um, you know, oh, we, I think we need this quote or we need to have the other side, you know, that kind of stuff, the content editing. The line editing for me, it was uh, making sure the commas were in the right spot or that the words were spelled properly or, you know, as as proper uh, as we could possibly make it. Grammar being OK. And the main thing being that we followed AP style, which is our style book. Um, 
kind of sometimes goes against logic. <laughs> <laughs> I was just talking to um, our intern Elaine about this, whom in regular listeners will have heard her in the last episode, but we were talking about the the good old days and then also AP Stylebook and how AP used to have website as two words with the W up, but web page was one word with the W down and webmaster was two words with the W up. And there's all these things that didn't make a lick of sense. And it drove me crazy because I wanted everything to be logical and fit in its own little box. Um, they finally they've changed it, and AP does change their style book every year. So you kind of have to be on your toes about some of those things. Email, for example, used to have a hyphen because it stands for electronic mail. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, currently e bike does have a hyphen because right. it's not as in common use. It does it stands for electronic bike or electric bike. Um, but they did make they took the hyphen, hyphen out of email a, a number of years <laughs> ago. Finally, so I have to do those kind of things. Make sure that. Um, the, the style was correct. And then once I'm happy with that, I would put it on the page and, uh, I typically wrote the headline on the page. We got a suggested headline from the reporters or the editor, but I would have to make it fit and make it look good. I didn't want the headline to be too big for the story or too small for the story. You know, I had to kind of use a judgment call on how the headline, what treatment it should get. If it was the, oh crap, Headline, or if it was more of a featurey headline, which could be something like an italics or a, a, a lighter font face. You know, those are the kind of things that I would have to do. And I would make mock ups of the front page based on early art and give them to the editor. And we'd go over, like, oh, maybe the story should go here. No, we should, you know, do this, make this photo bigger, smaller, whatever. So it was a lot of back and forth back then. Whereas now, to be honest, we don't have the, you know, it's a template. And, right. you know, that's, you get a photo this big and, you know, based on the template you choose. And that's kind of it. There's a tiny bit of back and forth. There is, yes. But not much. Limited. Right. There's not as much flexibility because you're not sitting next to the person. We're chatting. Right, you know? yeah. Um, so there's only so much you can do over chat. But they've uh, – I, I was much more um, unwilling, I guess, to give up my design credentials <laughs> to them at the beginning. Um, but uh, they've you know won me over and, and uh, I can kind of – understand where they're coming from. And, um, I think they know me well enough now to, if I do make a suggestion, they'll, they'll take it and, but mm-hmm. I'm not going to stand over their shoulder, so to speak, and just try to design their page for them or do their job for them. Right. Which was really hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> it was so tough. I'm so sorry to all the designers up there <laughs> who I probably drove away. <laughs> that dude, Tony's crazy. <laughs> um, and then, uh, when I first got there, we did not print straight to negative, um, you know, and, and just like a photography negative, that's what I'm talking about. It is a, a reversed image of the paper. Um, so back then we printed on three sheets of paper, 11 by 17 and somebody in what we called the back shop or composing would, um, cut the paper so that everything lined up perfectly. You had to sometimes cut between lines or cut around photos, but you're basically putting these three sheets together to make one large broadsheet. And that's what we call the size of our paper, the broadsheet. Um, you put it up on this piece of cardboard that has a grid on it so everything can line up right. Uh, the designers or the editors would come back and make sure everything is correct, do one final look at the page, and then we would initial the page so that, you know, if there was a mess up, you could kind of trace back to, all right, who, who screwed up here? Uh, and then they would go and they put it on this. Uh, it really was just a camera. Um, there was a lens mounted on the wall and there was a big glass contraption. So you put the broad sheet, uh, which had holes punched in it, and you line up the holes to some little pegs that were in the camera enclosure. You put a piece of glass down on it to hold it all in place and you lift the lever up and it goes from horizontal to vertical. And then the lens that is on the far wall would take the picture. Uh, and then a few minutes later out would pop the negative of that, um, of that page. Now, uh, a little while later we were able to print straight to negative. So we didn't have to do that process, but that was always really cool to me as being, being a photographer. I'm like, that's a big camera. That's so cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so you get the negative, we would, uh, roll it up, uh, emulsion side out so we didn't do any scratches uh that would be the the non-glossy side uh because we just didn't want to scratch any into the next you could scratch um you know whatever showed up white so if you scratch the black part of the negative off it showed up white and that would show up as black a black spot on 
your page. Uh, so we'd roll it up and drop it down a metal chute that went down to the press room or the plate room, actually. Uh, the plate room would then take the negative, um, put the negative on a piece of um, uh, metal and burn an image, a, a now positive image, onto the metal. And it would come out as kind of a bluish tint. Uh, and the metal plate was fitted such that it would it would fit on our press on the giant drum machine, this big, giant, round, you know, looked like a steamroller. Um, but you put the pages on that, and that would roll around and pick up the ink and then place the ink onto paper that was running underneath it. Uh, the specifics of that, I don't know. I mean, I don't know the science of it necessarily, but that's the general process is it would pick up the ink and, and put the ink on the page and do this really fast and very loud. It was always kind of nice to run down to the press and just watch it go. And the whole building shook. You could feel it upstairs when the press was running. It was really neat. Um, and uh, once we did hear the press running, because you, like I said, you could feel the building shake, we'd go down and do a press check. And it was another, an, one last final check on the page to make sure that everything was right. Sometimes maybe the wrong page would be in the wrong spot. You know, B1 would be where A3 should be. And it's just little things like that might happen. So we would go down, we'd take a piece of paper off the press as it's running uh, at the very beginning. They're still lining up the colors to make sure everything matches and stuff. And we'd go through real quick and check it, make sure it was the right date, and make sure they didn't get a plate from the day before, that kind of thing. And when it was good, we'd be so okay, run it, go. And they'd, they'd run it into high gear, and it would go into a mail room. And just like it is now, the people were inserting ads and it would go go out to your door from there but yeah that's how it that's back in the back in the good old days <laughs> that's how it was done now even before that there was typesetting where you had to take the letters and the you know uh i don't even kind of i don't even know how to describe it watch the post the movie the post and you get a little idea of uh the typesetting days and this was pre my newspaper career <laughs> wasn't there something that bothered you about the post and when they did the press check they were too clean <laughs> oh my god oh my god so you do a press check and the ink is fresh and so your hands are filthy and uh, uh tom hanks's character is wearing a white shirt with a tie which you know back then was fine but he was a little too put together and it was like everything was a little too clean and there's no such thing as a clean press room. Huh. And when the publisher, the Meryl Streep character goes down, you know, she's again grabbing the paper off there and, and, and looking at it. Their hands are too clean. And it the little things like that, it's like yeah, a newspaper guy is going to know that that's not the way it, it really is, you know. So, yeah, there's little there's little things in, in the post. But uh, at a future date, I do plan to have a. Uh, podcast based on our favorite uh, journalism or newspaper movies oh, or TV shows. Idea. So the, the post and might come up and some of the things that are right and wrong about all of them. So look for, forward to that uh, some other time. I'm going to pull the newsroom what their <laughs> favorite newspaper movie is. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's in a nutshell how it used to be and how it is now. Yeah. <laughs> I hope this sort of demystified things for everybody and you know, I hope it was at least somewhat interesting. It's interesting to me just because I'm a newspaper geek and I find that kind of stuff fascinating, how it was done before I got here and that kind of thing. Um, you've been in papers for what you said? It, six years now? Six years. So you don't have too much of the history. Um, when I started in newspapers at the Gilroy Dispatch, we um, this was pre-paginating on a computer. So it wasn't even done on the computer uh, so to speak, it, you had WordPress a word processor on the computer, but uh, when you printed out the stories, it was just in strips of of the width of a column uh, on the page. And we had to cut it out and run it through a waxing machine, put wax on the back of it and put it up on those same cardboard broadsheets that I mentioned earlier, lining up to the grid. But it was just column after column after column. And we have to cut between each line and move it up to the next column and, you know, air things out as best we could or to square it off. Um, and then the same thing, you put it on the camera, you take the picture and stuff. So it still looked the same. Um, but that was my first job in newspapers was that and doing the halftone machines. So you take a photo and you put it on this big machine and turn it into a halftone, which is uh, instead of 
what we would now think of as, as pixels. Uh, it turns it into a series of dots because our press prints in, in, in what's a series of dots. You know, that's just how presses work. So you'd have to half tone it uh, and get it properly exposed. And then you cut it out and you put a little piece of tape around the border that was like a one point border, we called it, or a half point border just to make it all line up. But you look at some of these old pages and you can actually see the border of the tape as it goes <laughs> around. It's you know kind of fascinating to look. But that is, uh, yeah, that's how that uh, was my first job, uh, you know, at the uh, Gilroy Dispatch. It's funny hearing these stories of how it used to be. It seems like newspapers used to be such a – working at a newspaper used to be such a tactile experience. Yes, yes, it really was. And now it's all on the screen pretty much. Yeah, I did a lot more walking around back mm -hmm. then. You walk down to the press, you know, down two flights of stairs and, you know, to check things. And you're walking to the back shop. And uh, now it's definitely uh, – it's a little bit more sterile. And you're sitting at your desk and you're looking at the computer screen. And mm -hmm. that's pretty much – you know, it, there's not as, there's not as much movement anymore for, I don't know, lack of a better way of thinking about it, but, yeah. but yeah, you're right. It was, That's it probably was true across industries. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure it is. But yeah, you're, you're right about it being not as tactile now as it, as it used to be. I mean, we had, our newsroom was filthy. Um, because <laughs> it, I mean, it was a newspaper. There's everything you touch had ink on it. So the walls would just – they were covered – they were dirty. The cubicles we were in were just dirty because you'd go down, you'd be – you know, if you're you, – you'd come in, you'd read the paper or a couple of newspapers in the morning, see what's going on, um, see what their pages look like, what stories they ran versus what you ran. And then you're just touching things all day long. <laughs> and so over the course of, you know, a couple of decades, like that, that building, that newsroom got pretty darn filthy. Did it have like a smell? It smelled like ink. Like, huh. like, 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 like a, the rubber stamp ink like that. Kind of. It's kind of like that. It's a very specific smell. And it's, mm. it's one of those things that will immediately take me back 20 years if I smell it again. <laughs> if I walk into a, a, a newsroom that does have its own press, that's just like, oh my God, this is, I remember this. This is what it was like. <laughs> this is crazy. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, get that. That smell, but you know, we're in this new office, brand new office. It was yeah. just built, and it has been very funny to me that uh, we've been trying to make sure things are clean, um, make sure that you know all of our boxes are put away, and you know, when people come in, we want to make sure that it's clean. What are we going to put on the walls? They're so white, <laughs> and part of me just kind of laughs at that. I'm, I'm not against that or opposed to that at all, but there's there's definitely that part that's just like this is hilarious we're a newsroom we're not supposed to be clean like where's the dirt <laughs> it kind of does feel like a tech company now yeah, i mean bit, the way yeah. it looks yeah it's uh, you know people are dressed casually we're not in suits and ties anymore and we've got like a blue wall i tried and to bring i tried wall. to bring back the the tie I, for for a while <laughs> i was wearing ties into work and i just i couldn't do it anymore and Although it would make more sense now because my tie wouldn't get stuck in anything. Yeah, right. I'd be really afraid my tie would get stuck in a in the press if I were wearing it back then. Well, maybe I need a tie clip or something. But <laughs> yeah, you know, there's you know there, there's definitely pros and cons to uh, how things were. You know, just the internet is is changing the industry, and you know, yeah. it's it's getting news out there quicker and and faster and. Um, you know, and I, I think ultimately that's a good thing. So there's no reason to hang on to the past simply for the purpose of hanging on to the past. But there's a nostalgia aspect to it. And, and mm -hmm. newspapers, if you know, we want to be completely honest, newspapers are sort of a nostalgia industry. Um, you know, we're trying to adapt and, and move forward like uh, like a tech company really mm -hmm. would. But the, the people who like the newspaper are, you know, ones who like routine and like, like that mm -hmm. nostalgia and like getting their paper, you know, as an actual paper and not right. you know, not online. I'm one of those paper people. I love the pro the process tactile of looking. Person. I'm a tactile person. <laughs> I love the process of reading the paper in the morning uh, as I'm drinking my coffee. Um, it's I don't know. It's just kind of a neat little feeling. I feel adult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know. I yeah I feel similarly. I used to read all my news on my iPad, but in the past uh, year or so, I've started getting uh, print subscriptions to different newspapers and magazines. And I feel like I read a lot more articles that I wouldn't have read yes. online. Yes, because you're not going to waste a click on, you know, an article that you're like, eh, 
yeah, I don't know. You know, you're not going to, you don't seem like you might waste that time online. Yeah. Right. You know, cause it's, you know, it takes so long to do that click, but it really does. If, I mean, if it didn't, we wouldn't be having this conversation, but, uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's stories that, um, and I'd mentioned this in a podcast before the eat your vegetable stories, mm-hmm. um, that aren't the sexy stories. They're not the ones that are going to, you know, drive traffic to your website kind of thing. They're the ones that are the process stories that this is what's going on in the council and nothing big happened this particular night, but this is what did happen. And it's, it's the eat your vegetable story. And you might, you might actually read that story on the paper and not in uh, online. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I'm sad for when the paper, does finally go away. Now, I'm not saying I don't know anything. Don't. We're not going <laughs> we're not, anywhere. We're not going where, but you can imagine that it's sometime in the future, and hopefully it's the very distant future. Uh, this would be an archaic, you know, the, the news having an actual paper. Now, maybe it's a flexible screen that you can slide th- your story. Who knows? You know, maybe more like Minority Report. So I'm not saying the paper's going away anytime soon. I'm just saying sometime in the distant future, technology is going to make it such so that there's something else. Download it to your brain. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm I'm sad for, for that just because, you know, I don't feel like I read as much when I'm doing it online. Well, th- we kind of veered off topic there for a little <laughs> bit, that's, but that's okay. You know, we're, we're just having fun here in this podcast and, you know, that's what we want to do sometimes here. Uh, and hopefully we enlightened people or at least made it somewhat interesting to let people know how things are and were at the newspaper and where we think they it might go from here. So, Kara, hey, I know you've been really busy today, so <laughs> thanks for taking a few minutes to uh, come and talk to me uh, yeah. and letting me get this podcast out. I, I thought maybe we weren't going to get it this week, but we got it. We snuck it in. <laughs> thank you all for listening yes, and thank supporting you. local journalism. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, if you have uh, any questions or any topics you'd like for me to uh, tackle here on the Reporter's Notebook, you can send me an email at tsolis at santacruzsentinel.com or call our Reporter Notebook hotline. Uh, it's really just a voicemail that you can call and we might play your question on the air. It is 831-706-3205. Again, that is 831-706-3205. Uh, you can listen to us on or you, sub- you can subscribe to us on iTunes, on uh, Google Play, on Stitcher, on iHeartRadio now. And coming in a few weeks, Kara doesn't even know about this yet. I'm going to tell it to her for the first time. Uh-oh. Spotify. Whoa. Yeah. Yes. Is that cool? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting us on all the platforms. Sweet. So uh, thank you for listening and uh, please subscribe and keep listening and uh, we'll you listen to us next week. Thank you. Thank you.